Uh, good afternoon and welcome to our webinar on health and medical data, storing and publishing health and medical data. Um, I'm Kate LeMay and I'm a Senior Research Data Specialist from the Australian National Data Service and I've got with me Jeff Christensen from QCIF. So there are um, probably some people here who are um, new to ANN, so I just wanted to introduce us. Um, we're a federally funded body and we work to make Australia's research data assets more valuable for researchers, research institutions in the nation through um, various means um, around data management and data sharing. So as I said, um, today's webinar will be about storing and publishing health and medical data. It's part of a series. Last week was our first one on funders and publishers and the recording of that is available on the ANS website in the presentation section already. Next week we'll be talking about ethics and um, legal issues around data sharing and as I said, I've got Jeff Christensen joining me from QCIF and uh, he's the Program Manager for Health and Life Sciences at QCIF and the University of Queensland's Research Computing Centre. He's been involved in the development of many national um, research IT infrastructure projects with a biomedical focus within Australia, including med.data, which he'll be speaking to us about. And prior to this, he was based in the UK, where he led a team who developed and maintained an international reference resource of embryo anatomy and associated gene expression patterns. So Jeff will be speaking to us um, in a little while. So firstly, I'd like to um, talk to you about um, data repositories in general and some things to think about when um, planning to uh, submit data to a repository. So when we're talking about a repository, we're not talking about just putting a file on Google Drive and making it um, shareable to other people. It's a managed environment capable for storing and sharing uh, data um, and usually has some process for um, curating and preserving data as well. So there's quite a few uh, different choices that pe um, people have when looking at what repository to use for their data. So institutions, um, and by institutions I mean in general universities, most institutions have a repository um, that may be able to either have uh, the data set plus metadata about it or just the metadata available. Now, when I say metadata, what I mean is the um, description of a data set. So that's things like um, who made it, when was it made, what's it about in general, and um, any information, extra information that a secondary user might need to know um, about that data set. Um, an advantage of having data in an institutional repository is um, that in general they're free and um, in Australia institutional repositories um, feed their metadata to um, a site that is owned by ANS uh, called Research Data Australia which I'll show you in a little bit and uh, Research Data Australia um, as I said, collects this information, this metadata about the data sets and provides a central point for people to go to to look for data sets within Australia. Uh, so there's also discipline specific re repositories uh, and the Australian Data Archive is an example of one of these. Um, the Australian Data Archive is uh, in general social science um, specific but it does have some um, medical and health um, data sets in there. It's a really great example of a repository that provides mediated access which is a concept I'll touch on next um, in my next slide. And um, Re3 Data is uh, a registry which I will also show you after this slide set um, and it's a registry of uh, discipline repositories so uh, you can go there and search for um, your discipline to see if there's a um, repository that's specific to your research. So there's also non-specific repositories uh, and it's some examples here are Figshare and Dryad. Um, these repositories uh, don't have um, specific types of data in there, they're quite general and um, they can, um, in the case of Figshare, they can hold uh, things other than data like um, papers, presentations, uh, posters, other things like that grey literature. So some of the things that um, a researcher might want to think about when they're looking at which uh, repository they want to deposit um, their data into are um, if they're being mandated or recommended a repository from say a funder or a journal that they're publishing in um, and I would uh, suggest in this case to check if it is a mandate or just a recommendation and to um, look into whether uh, you're actually required to put it there. Um, an example is if you uh, 
look at last week's uh, webinar, Wiley was speaking about that they have a deal with Figshare when you deposit data, you can deposit data into Figshare when you're putting a paper into a Wiley journal, um, but they're not mandating that, so they're um, repository agnostic. Uh, there are also discipline conventions, so an example of this is genomics, there's um, quite uh, well established discipline um, conventions in that area. Um, also some considerations might be if you're going to be able to publish the metadata and the data in the same place, um, so as I said some uh, institutional repositories have at this point the capacity for publishing metadata but maybe not holding the data and then um, what, where will you put that data, what will you do about that. Some repositories have uh, no cost and some do have a cost, so that's a consideration when, when you're looking at your choices. Uh, this concept of mediated access that I um, mentioned when I was talking about the Australian Data Archive, uh, this means that uh, you can have the description, the metadata of your data available publicly, it's findable, um, it's um, searchable, it's referenceable, uh, but the data itself is not available for public download. Uh, so in this case um, the access is mediated through some sort of means so that only say a legitimate researcher with a research question that can be answered by use of your data set um, is able to access this data. This can be done at a repository level with somewhere like the Australian Data Archive, it can be done at a researcher level, so I'll show you an example on Research Data Australia of um, a research uh, data set that uh, has mediated access through the researcher. Um, and another thing to consider is whether that repository allocates DOIs to data sets. So um, most people would be uh, familiar with DOIs, digital object identifiers from papers um, being assigned them. Uh, if data set is allocated a DOI, it can be cited in a reference list and that citation can be tracked in the same way as DOI citations are tracked for papers. So um, that's an advantage um, for the researcher if that is assigned to your data set. So I'd like to show you now um, a few websites that I mentioned. So one of this was Research Data Australia. You can come here and you can search um, for data sets. You can also browse by subjects, so that's worth having a look at. Here is the example of a um, medical and health related data set on Research Data Australia um, that has mediated access. Under this access conditions on the left hand side, it says to contact them to um, gain access to that data set. So it's got all the metadata that I was discussing earlier, uh, but that access is through the researcher. And the secondary user would be, have to also have ethical approval for getting that data set. And this is re3data.org. If you go to browse by subject, it's got this really fun, well I think it's fun, uh, graphic where you can um, look into subjects. So here if we click on medicine, that's the fun bit. Um, it pops up and you can look further into it um, to see if there's a, a repository that is related to your discipline. So now I'm going to hand over to Jeff and he's going to speak to us about med.data. Thanks very much for the invitation, Kate. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to talk to the group today. Um, what I'm going to talk about is an infrastructure project called med.data.edu.au, which we sometimes um, call med.data just to shorten. And, and this is a, a cloud-based um, data storage, computing and sharing um, system uh, for health and medical researchers in Australia. So last week at the, um, the ANS webinar, we heard from um, uh, Wee Ming Boon, and he reminded me about um, putting things in the context of the research life cycle. And this is a, an, an image of the um, uh, research life cycle from the NHMRC statement on data sharing. And um, this covers everything from, at the beginning, I guess, applying for funding and ethics approval, and then commencing research, undertaking research, and then disseminating the results. And what is apparent, um, I guess, these days, in, and particularly since data, a lot of data has been born digital, is that data is, um, and digital data is central to this life cycle. So when one is um, attempting, I guess, to wrangle uh, all of these uh, data resources, uh, there's a number of items of infrastructure that you need in place. So uh, when one is um, collecting data, we obviously need to store it somewhere. And that may be on a shared system, it may be 
on a laptop, it may be in, in various places. Um, also when we store it, we need to manage it, so we need to organize it, so this is putting it into directories that, that mean something and also um, uh, attaching metadata, so information about the data to make it useful. And I guess there's two, two levels of metadata which can be uh, uh, thought of, and one is a collection level, so this particular data set or folder over here contains information associated with research project X. Um, the other is that you can attach metadata to items within the actual and within the actual um, uh, data repository that you have. Um, so, for instance, you could say, "Well, this is a file, and that file is associated with a person um, that has various characteristics." The other aspect of management that's worth thinking about is sharing it with collaborators during the life during the life cycle. So, those collaborators may be people within your own lab, or they may be within the same institution, um, but they could very well be international, based internationally. So having a system that allows you to easily uh, manage and share data is, 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 is really um, central to undertaking research. Um, obviously uh, data by, by itself is not particularly useful unless it's subjected to some kind of analysis. So there's a plethora of analysis tools that one can apply to data. Um, they might be commercial, they might be open source. Um, and analysis tools all need compute power to be able to run. So um, again, this computing power may be offered through something like a, a desktop machine or a laptop. Um, institutions may offer computational resources. Um, there are cloud providers. I'll talk a little bit about a national research cloud here in Australia that's, um, that's come about through the Nectar uh, project. And then there's also high performance computing facilities. So these are, these are really for doing uh, uh, number crunching on, on very large data sets or on data sets that require uh, a lot of computation in a parallel fashion. And then once the analysis has been done and um, the, the results have been gleaned, um, it's important to be able to disseminate the results. And Kate was just talking about a number of great repositories there, I guess, uh, such as Dryad and Figshare, which are really, really useful um, as data repositories to disseminate results um, and data associated with results from a research project. Um, so this webinar is about health and medical related uh, topic and um, so what's so special about health and medical research data? So primarily um, because it's um, health and medical, it includes a proportion of data that is derived from or is directly related to human beings that have participated in research. Um, within, those, within those data, um, single human be beings may also be individually identifiable. Um, I'll just point out that the, the um, term individually identifiable is used in the, national MA, the NHMRC National Statement on Ethical Conduct in Human Research, um, and it, it defines um, three levels of, of um, identifiability, one of which is individually identifiable. Um, so single human beings may actually be individually identifiable in a proportion of data associated with the research project to some people within that research collaboration. So if um, the data is individually identifiable and it also contains information about a person's health or their genetic information or any biometric information, um, it's also considered to be sensitive um, and that's defined by the Privacy Act, the Commonwealth Privacy Act. Um, and if data is sensitive, um, it carries legal and ethical responsibilities in ensuring that the information um, is not intentionally or inadvertently disclosed to non-authorised individuals. Um, so when conducting research, effectively everybody has a shared ethical, everybody um, related to that research has a shared ethical responsibility to ensure that harm doesn't come to any research participant through unauthorised release of identifiable data. As I said, that may be non-intentionally. Someone might accidentally give access to someone or give access to someone and then um, they uh, shouldn't have done that and then so there's issues there. Or the other one is um, uh, through things like um, hacking of systems and various things like that, which I guess is fairly topical at the moment. Um, so when one is uh, considering using uh, health and medical research data, especially if that data is going to be um, identifiable, um, a process of risk management is required. So, you know, we have to be able to store that information and use it and share it with uh, collaborators, but it, it's, it's imperative that that is done in a suitably safe manner. 
Um, Med.data is effectively data infrastructure a uh, data infrastructure. And as operators of data infrastructure, we have a duty to um, data custodians of, of a particular data set and also researchers using that data set to demonstrate that we have appropriate levels of maturity and discipline in information security practice to be able to store human-derived research data. And we also have to have a repertoire of, of, of safeguards in place to assure custodians of the security of the information when it's held on systems like this. So they may be administrative, um, so for instance policies, they may be physical, so do we use um, appropriate, um, appropriately secure data centres, and then there's also a plethora of technical um, safeguards that one can apply to data um, infrastructure in this space. Uh, so what is MED.data? So effectively we're nationally funded data infrastructure for health and medical research data. Um, we've received NCRIS, so that's National Collaborative um, Research Infrastructure Scheme funding, uh, through two projects, the RDSI, which was Research Data Storage Infrastructure, and the Research Data Services projects. So interestingly, um, on the NH and MRC statement on data sharing, um, this is alluded to. So um, Kate mentioned a little bit of the infrastructure within this may be provided um, from an institution. Um, also, Dryad that gets a mention there, but there's also established, established networks and, and projects across the country that have been nationally funded, including research data storage infrastructure. I should point out Intersect, um, we're going to mention in a minute as one as another organisation that's mentioned in the NH and MRC statement on data sharing. So as data infrastructure, we provide um, a number of, of, of uh, features. So one is cloud storage for um, health and medical research data. So um, this is, um, I guess, uh, set in a number of uh, uh, data centres around the country, and I'll talk to that. It's networked um, over the RNET um, high-speed uh, research network backbone. Um, we have data management tools that can be associated with the data storage. So uh, MediaFlux and MyTardis are uh, excellent um, uh, tools that provide um, data structuring and also attachment of uh, metadata to particular um, items within, within collections and also some other uh, features such as encryption. Um, and Asfera is, uh, is a tool for high-speed um, transfer and um, also uh, very good for structuring data into directories and also has um, really good encryption capabilities. Uh, associated with the storage and management um, is compute resources um, and analysis tools. So uh, with Med.data we rely on uh, back, uh, computing that sits behind uh, the data storage or is associated with the data storage. Um, some of this is maybe cloud, um, so I mentioned a little bit about the Nectar Research Cloud. So this is another NCRIS funded project um, to provide cloud compute, a cloud uh, research cloud for Australian researchers. Um, and there's also a number of high performance computing or parallel computing um, systems that are uh, highly associated with this particular data set. Um, Analysis tools, primarily with uh, med.data, uh, the, use the users of the storage have been uh, bringing their own software. So it may be, as I said, it may be a commercial product or it may be an um, uh, open source product, but that, that software is run on the compute that's associated with the, with the um, data storage. And then dissemination of results and data access is really important. So um, we also have a data registry that's closely coupled with um, the data storage. And uh, this actually uh, leverages um, uh, Research Data Australia, which we just, uh, which Kate just uh, mentioned. Um, so we have a widget built into our website which um, can present um, information that's described in, in Research Data Australia on this particular site. And that's for data that's stored on this infrastructure. Uh, we also have a resource library, which I think is, uh, is, is proved to be very popular. So um, I think a lot of people in this space are fairly confused by uh, what is the legislative and the best practice um, uh, landscape uh, when dealing with health and medical research data that's derived from humans. Um, so we have a resource library there. Um, and I think next week's um, uh, topic will also touch on that. Um, and we also talk about IT security frameworks that may be, that, that are suitable for 
um, I guess, describing the security features of, of, of uh, data infrastructure. Um, and I'll talk a little bit um, in a minute about the Australian Signals Directorate Information Security Manual. Um, and something else that has also proved very popular is we just have a, a, an interactive use guide. So this is really to find out if you're thinking about using Matt data, is it going to be right for your data? So um, it's interactive, it leads through a decision tree. So there's up to eight questions um, and it can be very useful for um, finding out uh, information in a directed fashion. Um, so who manages MED.data? Um, so the project is actually led by Intersect and Intersect, QCIP and VicNode are the three primary uh, partners in this particular project and URSA has been involved in uh, preliminary stages of this uh, project as well. So collectively, um, I should say that QCIP, Intersect and VicNode are uh, organisations that are um, uh, so we're e-research organisations um, and we have member universities. So together we have 23 universities and what we do is we work with IT infrastructure groups and others of those, at those institutions to, um, to provide value to those particular institutions. So there are a lot of uh, uh, universities affili or, uh, affiliated through this particular um, groupings. Um, so who is using uh, Med.data and, and prior to answering that I guess I should say who can use it and effectively anyone can use it in Australia so um, you feel free to contact us and I'll, I'll give you some um, uh, how, to, how to do that at the end. But who is using it now? So we have uh, um, about 2.6 petabytes of data stored. Um, just to give you some context that equates to about 600,000 DVDs or I think about 8 million CDs. Um, so it's a lot of data. Um, primarily, um, it's I guess can be classified. The, the vast majority is is human derived genomics data, and then human derived imaging data, and then a much smaller proportion of information that's collected from biosensing, biosensor experiments, or data derived from biospecimens or from epidemiological observational and simulation studies. Um, and again, if we look at the number of data sets per type, again, genomics, we definitely have the, the largest amount. Um, who, who is using it? Uh, we currently have research groups from 20 organisations, so uh, not all of these organisations are uh, members of, of the three, uh, of QCIP, Intersec and uh, VicNode, as I mentioned before. Um, so we have researchers from six universities, um, and including, uh, so I guess, uh, fairly independent uh, research centres within those universities. Um, nine medical research institutes and also other organisations, including hospital-based research groups. So I just want to say a little bit here now about identifiable versus non-identifiable data. So at the moment, the majority of the six petabytes data is uh, classified as re-identifiable or non-identifiable. Again, these are classifications that are used in the statement of, of ethical conduct in human research. Re-identifiable is where a temporary identifier has been attached to information that has been um, anonymized. So this may have a, a, a classifier, so an, an alphanumerical number that actually identifies the participant within the study that can't be traced back to actually um, reveal the identity of that person. And then non-identifiable data is data that's never had any, any kind of identifying information attached. Um, I guess the reason why uh, most of this is currently re-identifiable or non-identifiable is that a lot of the uh, researchers that are using MEN.data are actually given access to data sets that have already been um, de-identified by third parties. Um, however, uh, we can still actually um, uh, store identifiable, uh, individually identifiable data. However, prior to doing that, we urge that we have a discussion about risk management. So this is really important that um, the data custodian of that data set and the, and, the, and the infrastructure providers have this conversation. So we need to, we need to understand collectively what's the sensitivity level of this data. Um, but it's also really important to understand from a, as an infrastructure provider use cases of how this data may be used. So how will it be used? Would it be used on a, on a HPC system? or would it be used, um, would a cloud, a virtual machine in the cloud environment be, su be sufficient? 
It's also really important to understand where are the users. Are they based within a university or maybe they're based in a medical research institute or maybe they're based overseas. So it's, it's also really important for us to be able to understand that um, to, uh, to have a better idea of how the data can be um, housed and protected and also yeah, by who. So um, again, are, are all the people within one research group or are they, or are they across others? So this, as I said, dictates the specifics of the uh, IT security setup. Um, so I should just say that the security policies are actually set by each node operator um, and we're very, very happy to discuss with data custodians and, and particularly the, uh, as well the institutional IT security officers of researchers or data custodians as to the setup of, of our particular um, infrastructure. Um, we can provide a uh, uh, um, uh, sort of a comparison of how we um, shore up against the Australian Signals Directorate Information Security Manual principles and controls. And I should just say that these are effectively the, the Australian standards for information security. Um, so uh, if you'd like to know more, uh, we have a couple of uh, uh, methods so you could contact us. There's a, a contact page on the website. And as I said before, that there's an interactive use guide. Um, I should just say before uh, closing off that um, to thank the funders, so it was NCRIS funded this project, uh, primarily through RDS and RDSI. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Jeff, for talking about med.data. Um, I've just received one little um, question. Um, are most of the ethics committees requiring full ethics for data sharing or LNR? Um, this is a um, good question. Uh, we will be talking about ethics next week. Um, so ethics committees um, can vary uh, in their attitudes to data sharing. This is a new uh, concept that has, um, that um, some ethics committees are uh, coming up against. We have a guide available on our website for ethics committees as um, a bit of an introduction to data sharing. Um, so if there are any ethics committees members or you know anyone who's in an ethics committee, please feel free to point that out to them. Um, but in general, uh, if information is identifiable, um, you definitely have to have the consent of the participants participants to be able to share data. Um, if the data is non-identifiable, it doesn't fall under the Privacy Act and um, can be uh, shared. Um, however, there are other aspects um, that ethics committees may consider. So um, it, it's, it's a bit of a it depends answer. Jeff, do you have anything uh, to add to that? Oh, no, I was just going to say that um, there are, I guess, quite a lot of data questions in the new um, human, res human Research Ethics application um, form and uh, one thing we're considering doing is actually providing some uh, further, I, I guess, advice on our site um, about how one can uh, respond to that question if they're considering using uh, metadata. Yep. Someone uh, has also asked for more details on um, how this stacks up to the principles and controls from the government ISM um, and were after more details on how we can access this. I believe that this is one of those questions um, that Jeff, um, they would need to contact uh, their local yeah, node we, to discuss. We would, have an, we would have an individual conversation because um, by actually disclosing your security setup, you're actually it's just actually a security risk to do so. So we will have those conversations one by one, but we're not going to publish a list on the website saying, well, we actually adhere to all of these and not to all of these. I guess I should just clarify a little bit more about the ASD. So um, there's a number of classifications in that document and they range from protected and sensitive, which are the classifications we're utilizing for um, this type of data up to top secret um, and obviously we're not building a system for top secret information. A lot of it uh, comes back to policies and um, for us it's that we, we each of the nodes have security policies and information security policies um, and within that again it's it's really important that we clarify roles and responsibilities so we, we effectively provide a secure container for the for the data and we want our uh, the the people that are using our systems to effectively use that secure container in a responsible manner. So it's definitely a shared thing. But um, please uh, contact us through the website, um, and we can we can have a discussion about how we how we uh, stack up against those controls. Yep, 
Absolutely. And there was just one little uh, last question. Someone asked what about re-identifiable data. So when we were talking about um, non-identifiable um, and identifiable uh, in that question about ethics, um, for me, uh, re-identifiable data, um, if it's, my understanding is if it's separated from the key that can re-identify it, um, then the data set that has, does not have any of the identifiers in it um, is shareable, but again, uh, best to, always best yeah. to get consent. And, and, and we also have some advice. So we have one of our guide in the resource sections on uh, anonymization and there's actually no Australian uh, specific guidance about how to generate those keys, but um, uh, the uh, US um, HIPAA Act, the um, Health Insurance Privacy Portability Act, um, has some really good tips, I guess, on yes. how to generate um, these types of identifiers. And basically, it shouldn't be derived from anything that was ever associated with that person. Yes. Um, Another tip that's covered on the, on that page is also, and, and the ASD I think does provide the guidance from memory, is that the identifying information should never be stored on the same system as the keys. Um, the keys should be stored somewhere else and also encrypted. Yep, absolutely. Um, and just one last thing to say about de-identification, ANS also has a guide about de-identification on our website and um, it points off to a lot of um, uh, international and national guidance about um, these that process that you can go through. And um, these terms identifiable, re-identifiable and non-identifiable, as Jeff said, they're in the National Statement on Ethical Conduct in Human Research and um, that, that statement is currently undergoing review. Um, who knows how long these government processes take, but um, that quest that those three um, uh, identifiers, those three terms, are um, currently under um, the terms of the review. So um, we'll keep our eye on whether they um, continue being the terms, but um, that's just something to uh, note for the future. So I'd just like to thank Jeff very much for speaking to us about med.data. Thank everyone for coming in today.